just on the shores of the Heavenly Lake, outside of Rumki in western China. Traditional girl over my shoulder, blue sky and sun, beating down with a little bit of snow on the ground and a cup of green tea. Hard to beat. We're at the East Gate of Jiaohu, which was an ancient city in China. In fact, founded in around about the 4th to 6th century BC, lasting until 1275, and was for a period of time a capital of one of the 36 kingdoms of China. It's protected as a World Heritage Site because they say it's one of the finest examples of a mud brick built city in the world and the only one that had no city walls. The reason it had no city walls is because it's protected by 30 metre or higher cliffs around the entire circumference of the city. It sits on an island between a couple of rivers. And it lasted for around about 1600 years until the Mongols came in and sacked the place. In between the time, it was one of the vital stops along the Great Silk Road. If you were coming from the west, you'd cross the border into China, and this would be one of the first cities you'd see before you headed to Kashgar or Xi'an. And if you were Chinese going the other way, this was the last one of the homeland cities you'd see before you'd hit the wild steeps and confronted, I don't know, Mongolians, Huns, Uyghurs. You could cross the Karakorom Desert and hit Lake Izikul in modern day Kyrgyzstan and go for a swim and to refresh yourself for the last couple of thousand kilometers, you and your camels would wander down to Persia or the Red Sea to start your trading. Think about this, for nearly, uh... 1500 years this was the capital city of a kingdom and think about the thousands of people that used to live here work here happiness here sadness here and I love to come into places like this and look at the old ruins and imagine what it would have been like way back then when people lived here and how much we now just come through and kick the dust and wonder what it was like or just look at some old one mud walls and think and imagine in a thousand years from now if our societies collapsed and our cities collapsed imagine what the future tourists will be doing when they look at the ruins of wall street or big ben and wondering what those old cities were when they're covered in dust welcome to the flaming mountains outside turpan in western china it's called the Flaming Mountains because the summer heat here can be unbearable. They say the surface temperature can get up to 80 degrees Celsius. And imagine what that would have been like, just you and your camel full of goods walking through this area and the heat coming through the bottom of your sandals and the dust in your lungs. It's enough to make you wanna climb down this cliff face to take a dip in the river. That's what life in the Silk Road in China would have been like. And as you entered China, coming from the west towards east, you would have been reaching your goal in Xi'an in central China. And as you're coming uh, west out of China, you're just at the very beginning of your travels. Have you ever thought about this? All these people coming along the Silk Road converging for trade from different language groups and cultures. How do they communicate? Not everyone's at university back in those days learning different languages. Well, there are interesting ways of doing it. And I was thinking about this last night because I was at the night market wanting to buy some dinner and I wanted some dumplings. And I looked at the dumplings at this dumpling seller and she looked back at me. She couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak Uyghur or Chinese. So I looked at her and I said, these dumplings, are they chicken? And she said, nope, they're beef. We found a way of communicating. It's the agnostic power of trade. When people have an incentive, they'll find a way of coming together. Dotted throughout each of these cliffs are many caves nicknamed the Thousand Buddha Caves because there are thousands of Buddhas inside them, or more accurately, I should say, were. This part of the Silk Road was a heart of Buddhist belief and many of these caves were monasteries. When Islam came, many of the frescoes were defaced by chiseling out the face of the Buddha. But that wasn't the worst of it. 
The term between the 18 and 1900s, a German archaeologist appropriately named Lecoq not only chiselled out the faces but chiselled out the entire frescoes together with many of the statues of Buddha and took them back to Berlin to the Berlin Museum for safekeeping where they did stay safe for a little less than two decades until the Allies bombed the hell out of Berlin including the museum and turning all of these fine parts of human heritage to dust. I'm currently about 10 metres underground at Karaz, which is an underground water system built in the desert. Many of them started 2,000 years ago. This particular one was built about 1700. It was an underground irrigation system to bring water from the water table under the mountains down to the fields where they were growing agriculture. Now, when you think about it, every 10, 20, 30 metres or so, they dug a hole 10 metres underground or however deep they needed to go, some as deep as 80 metres, mm -hmm. to reach the water table, and then dug a flat channel to be able to transport the water. Now, I think 2,000 years ago, how do you build a, a channel that could be many kilometres long, which slopes slightly? And you need to dr have a slope drop about one centimetre, sorry, about one centimetre every kilometre or so to get the right speed of water flow. More than that, the water goes too fast and is dangerous, and less than that, the water doesn't flow. So think, 2,000 years ago, you're 10 metres, 20 metres, 30 metres underground, and you're digging a channel which is 80 metres across and maybe, sorry, 80 centimetres across and maybe a metre high, and you're keeping the channel flat without any modern tools or technology. Incredible. As you can understand at the underground water system you would find a lot of Chinese trinkets and, and uh, souvenirs including the Chinese kangaroo. G'day mate. We're about three hours drive from Arumki in a town called Turpan which is the second lowest part in the world. Second only to the Dead Sea. A lot of this area is below sea level and it reaches from minus about 30 to plus about 50. So if you in Australia think we have a harsh climate, you should come here. I am outside the Imin Minaret built in 1777 while the Americans were busy kicking the British out of the United States. Imin was the local Islamic ruler here. He'd pledged his allegiance to the Qing Dynasty as part of China and he was a leader of the Uyghur people. The Uyghur people live in this western part of China, stretching from Arumki down to Kashgar a name that echoes through the history of the Silk Road, and they're Islamic. But we can also see in this area a lot of Buddhist traditions around the old ancient Buddhist caves, giving another example of how religions had interrelated and coexisted all along the Silk Road. So we have a small mausoleum on the right, and to the left next to it, we have other burial chambers where you see the black soot of smoke that has been burnt from oil lamps, which they say dates back to the shamanist religion way back from the early years before Christ. But you also still have around here, like in Uzbekistan, hints of the Zoroastrianism, particularly at weddings. In Uzbekistan, the married couple would walk three times around a fire, believing it would bring them luck. And they do something similar in Uyghur weddings here as well. But while we're talking about the Uyghurs, let's talk about one aspect of culture that's very important, which is language. The alphabet that is the Uyghur language uses is very similar to the Arabic alphabet. And the Chinese government has insisted in the provincial government here that all signs need to be both in the Chinese script but in the Uyghur script and the Uyghur script must be above the Chinese script. So while many people in the West might see China as one great monolith, it really is a mix of different cultures, languages, religions and histories that have come together in the modern day China that we see today. For centuries grapes have been important to the local economy, not winemaking, eating grapes and these vineyards date back many, many years. And the villages here haven't changed that much, honestly, over the last, well, few centuries. Some clay bricks are giving away to baked bricks. But otherwise, this is one of the parts of China that hasn't changed too much 
yet. And now here's something to think about the next time you bunch down or munch down on your spaghetti. Just down the road from here is an old cave in which they found 2,500 year old noodles made very much like these ones are being made now. Some say that Turpan is the home of noodles and some also say that Marco Polo brought spaghetti to Italy. Maybe this is where the spaghetti bolognese started from. Welcome to the Kashgar Sunday Market, and regardless of whether you want to buy a camel or a yak, it's buyable here. And back in the days of the Silk Road, entering China and coming into Kashgar was the first sign that you were entering those markets. From Kashgar, you also went down to Xi'an when you're going east or west. It was the last big market out of China. And as you can see from the noise and the hustle and bustle, Kashgar has remained true to its history and its background of being a market where you can buy and sell everything. Kashgar market, as well as being true to the history and heritage of Kashgar, remains a melting pot of cultures and peoples from everywhere. Just looking around the dress, you see the Kyrgyz, you see Chinese, you see Tajiks, you see Pashtuns, all converging on this market, proving again, still today, a couple of thousand years of the Silk Road, in many ways, is still running here. If you don't believe me, ask the camel. So the story goes, Marco Polo turns up here sometime around about 1200 and something or other and saw a round circular dish with some meat and vegetables and things on it. He liked the look of it and wanted to try it and the person cooking it used the local word for well when it's ready. And the local word for when it's ready is pizza. He liked it so much he took it back to Italy and told people you need to wait for your pizza. So maybe, just like spaghetti, pizza came from Western China. But don't tell the Italians. We're about to start heading down the Karakorom Highway. Goes from Kashgar to Islamabad. Up through there to the Kunjarab Pass. It's a beautiful blue lake. Sand dunes on the other shore. It'll be a great place to stop and swim if not for one problem. We're at about 3,300 meters and we're below 10 degrees Celsius. And this magnificent landscape here reminds me of another thing about the Great Silk Road. We are now on what's modern day Karakorom Highway going from Kashgar down towards Islamabad or vice versa, which would then link up with the road that went over the Khyber Pass and into Afghanistan. You had to, in the old days, back in the Silk Road, pack for so many different climates for altitude, for sub-zero, for snow, for desert, for 40 degrees, and all of that had to come with you on the back of your camel. I love the Karakorom Highway, overseen by these great mountains, majestic, stretching thousands of meters high, five, six, seven thousand meters. I feel like I'm coming home, not because it's like Australia, but because it's like Pakistan and the time I spent there. And this dusty road is the Karakorom Highway, soon to be replaced by a modern, brand new bitumen road. So trade can continue and expand up the modern new Silk Road. And this southwestern region of China remains at the cutting edge of some of the technological issues for the new Silk Road, as well as the old Silk Road. The juxtaposition of these solar panels underneath this mountain range tells a good story. Economic development takes a lot of energy 
and few countries understand this in the way China does. And while many in the West might think of China as the world's biggest polluter, they're not the world's biggest polluter per head of population. That honour remains with Australia. And China is investing more in solar technology as a proportion of their economy than Australia is. They're investing more in wind as a proportion of their economy than Australia is. A few years ago, China started to degrid some of their basic infrastructure, like streetlights. And many of them now have their own solar panel and their own windmill, generating all the electricity that's needed to fire the streetlights with small batteries held underground. Underground because batteries don't work well in cold weather, and this gets to minus 30. So China is investing heavily in cold weather battery technology as well. And when you see this going up all throughout China, you wonder why Australia doesn't degrid a lot of their basic infrastructure. LED streetlights can well and truly run on freestanding power, either by wind or by solar. And indeed, just a few weeks ago, both China and the United States were criticising Australia's greenhouse policy and its inability to meet the Paris targets. We emit more greenhouse gases per head of population than everybody else, and we are now lagging behind China in environmental standards. Think about that. More than any other country, China understands the fine balance between energy usage and economic development, and then as a middle class grows, the desire of the middle class to have clean air and clean nature. And it is one of the ongoing challenges for China to ensure that economic progress and environmental progress go hand in hand. And it's a fine balance for them to transition away from fossil fuels and into renewable energy whilst not upsetting the economic growth strategy that they have. Whether they can achieve this fine balance is a critical issue for the entire globe. It's bloody windy outside, so I'm huddled inside the old kitchen area of this caravanserai which is at least 600 years old and they built the caravanserais near the rivers so you didn't have to cart water but also walking along the river's edges through mountains saved you going up and down too much and this old caravanserai is on the Karakorom highway about two three hours drive or about four or five days walk outside of Kashgar and if you want to know what a caravanserai is think about it as an old Silk Road version of a motel and this was once a motel room. Next to this caravanserai is a summer village for the local Tajik people and the Tajik people here in China are still semi-nomadic so they have a summer village and a winter village and they've just left the summer one as we're about to huddle into winter as the cold wind and the ice capped mountains outside tell us. But the other thing this Tajik village shows is the blend of old and new, the old traditions with the new solar panels and the recycling of some car windows into the windows of their huts. And it is this juxtaposition between old and new that perhaps can introduce us to the last part or the last story of our journey to Western China. Behind me is the ancient stone city of Tashkigal. Tashkigal was founded 2,200 years ago and was the capital of one of the ancient 36 kingdoms. It is ethnically Tajik, which is no surprise given that we are a mere stone's throw from the modern day Tajikistan border just over there, the Afghan border just there, and the Pakistan border just down there. You can also imagine by its geography that through most of its history, this was an incredibly important town on the ancient Silk Road. It was the last town leaving China and the first town entering China. But nowadays, as the Silk Road has gone, you might think that Tashkagol is a backwater. And at the moment, it kind of is. It's in the region, a population of about 500,000 people, which in Australian terms would be a village of about four. But that's not to say the future for Tashkagol looks bleak. In fact, quite the opposite. The government of China has a one bridge, one road policy. It is one new sea road linking new and vital markets in a new seaborne silk road, including India and Pakistan, Southeast Asia, and in fact, many of the countries that have signed up to the new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. 
Unfortunately, Australia hasn't yet signed up to the one bridge, one road policy, which might be problematic for future generations and leave Australia more of a backwater than Tashkagol. The one bridge is a land bridge linking all the former uh, Silk Road countries and one or two in East Africa. This one bridge, one road policy was announced by President Xi in 2013. And so far they are planning multi-trillion, not multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar infrastructure investments shared by the one bridge, one road uh, countries. And you see new economic development happening right through Central Asia and an enormous amount of infrastructure being built in China to meet the one bridge, one road policy. Now, China is not doing this in an ad hoc way. They are in a very careful and well thought out way looking at options for future trade routes. Like the old North Silk Road and the old South Silk Road, there are very many roads, rail and gas pipelines that China are building. Just recently, China opened the new Beijing to Afghanistan Railroad with the Beijing to Karachi Railroad in Pakistan well under planning and indeed well under construction. There are new air routes that are coming in. New cargo routes have just opened up from Islamabad to Kashgar, for example. And what under President Xi's leadership, the Chinese government want to do is not just control all the sea routes, but all the road, rail and gas pipelines for most of the most important future trade. So next time you read in the newspapers something about China's policy in the South China Sea, think about that and think about also the amazing geography that all the new Silk Road will go through, matching the amazing geography that the old Silk Road went through. So maybe I can conclude my video to China with that thought about the future. China, the country combined with India that had 87% of the global economy in the year 1500, and less than 10% of the global economy in the year 1950, is rising to the second most powerful economy in the world and will soon not rise to the most dominant, but return to the most dominant country in the world. And if you can't see the writing on the wall and plan for the future education of your children and position your country in a place which will be accepted as a trade and political partner for the new rising dominance, then you'll condemn your future to that. Or you can take the opportunity to be one of the critical countries in the new Silk Road.